And so I have an amazing person. I've actually had the chance to edit a lot of her content and been with her for a lot of her um, video content journey, so to say. And I'm having Stephanie Lugo here on the XYZ. I hated everything about my industry before I joined it. We quickly found that real estate is like the hardest industry to be consistently successful and profitable in. Virality doesn't always pay. You're posting a ton of memes on a page of where you're wanting to talk about something else. If one of those memes goes viral, how are you cashing in on it if it's not going to go towards that altogether goal? Yeah, you can create all the actionable tips in the world, but it, if you're acting like Dr. Google, like yeah. you're not having a, you're not giving yourself the chance to let your passion shine through. And I think that that's really important for people to see. Like people don't want to just be talked at. We're creating for two reasons. We're creating to serve and we're creating to... If you have found your way here, you are a real estate pro who's ready to transition from chasing leads to getting dream clients to chase you. This podcast is where you will learn the business and system strategies you need to grow your real estate business so that you can get paid consistently, connect with dream clients, and keep your sanity. So I have an amazing person. I've actually had the chance to edit a lot of her content and been with her for a lot of her um, video content journey, so to say. And I'm having Stephanie Lugo here on the XYZ. Uh, why don't you give like a two sentences of like the most interesting thing about you? The most interesting thing about me is that I hated everything about my industry before I joined it mm. and had to find a way to fall in love with it because it was sort of a... <laughs> You made your bed, now lie in it situation. <laughs> so I uh, I guess a little bit of like where I came to be. Currently, I am a real estate agent. And okay. a big part of that is also coaching other real estate agents in the way that I do business with my husband. Um, this started about 10 years ago. It was kind of that classic like flipping the bird to the corporate life. Nice. Left our nine to five, wanted to do our own thing. And real estate seemed like a really easy and fun way to make a good living. And we quickly found that real estate is like the hardest industry to be consistently successful and profitable in. Mm. And you have to just eat a lot of just crap in real estate. You could say. I don't yeah. care. <laughs> you do though. You, you really yeah. have to just like do a lot of the things that you don't want to freaking do. Mm. And we had to find a way to make it sustainable for us because we're sitting there thinking like three years into the business, wow, every year it's like starting over again. How do we continue to make a good living in this in this world of entrepreneurship, like which is real estate, you are your own business owner, um, while doing things that still feel good and out of service and out of connecting with other people instead of falling into what a lot of perceive as real estate being like a salesy, slimy trap. Yeah. That's like taking advantage of the consumer. That was not what we got into real estate for. And so we had to find a way to really learn how to love this business that we chose to get into. And uh, we decided to really go all in on social media and video to help grow our gotcha. audience, grow our brand, and continue to connecting with people in an authentic way that would still work for us in the background, even while we weren't actively producing. So what that means is like, how could we create video? How could we create a digital brand that's going to continue connecting with people, even if it's at like three in the morning and we're not actively working? Totally. And I would say even beforehand, we saw, I think that's my notifications on one of my many computers. Let it's me okay. mute that. <laughs> um, Actually, a love thing about these watches is that you can actually just do it here, which is amazing. I keep learning all these crazy things with the Apple watches, and I'm like, oh. I still learn new things. Like, especially, like, I, I just now started using, um, like, the theater mode in my watch. So you can What's have, that? like, if you're in a movie theater, you can have, like, it's like the, the faces in, like, the quick menu next to Do Not Disturb. So, like, it'll, like, oh, give yeah. you notifications so it just keeps it dark. Oh. Yeah, you're seeing okay. Dune two later. I am. I am so, super excited about it. Yeah, it's one I I'm gonna go on record. It's probably the best movie I've seen in the past decade. So so excited. If you don't like it, it's okay. I understand. I think I did a review. I have not heard one person not like it. Okay, that's good to hear because I was worried about it. My wife didn't like it as much as she thought she wanted to. Okay. Um, but you know, with spouses, sometimes when your spouse is like super up in arms about something, they're like, it's not that great. You gotta <laughs> they just like, want to be devil's advocate. Just, just <laughs> um. 
Anyways, back to what we were talking about. So <laughs> I want to say, so you started down this road of video content. But I remember actually looking at your video, uh, your YouTube channel before I started editing for it. And you did like a, a lot of really good YouTube videos about real estate and yeah. Instagram specifically. But before that, you did those honeymoon videos that actually um, popped off for being travel vlogs that a lot of people aspire to be. And they actually did really well. Can you t I never asked you this question, so I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah. Why do you think those went well? And then did, was that kind of like the the what the dynamite that kind of pushed you in the direction of like we should do more video? I mean, I can give you like the high level version of the question sure. or the very meta quest like answer to give the me question. both. I want okay. them both. High level is fun, aspirational, easy for anyone to watch. Gotcha. It was very broad, top of funnel content that wasn't targeted towards any one um one niche or audience. Mm -hmm. It was just something that's fun and entertaining, which is great for YouTube, right? And what what these were was Bryce and I love travel. My husband okay. and I love travel and that's part of why we wanted to get into um just being our own biz our, our own boss, so to mm -hmm. speak, because we want the freedom and flexibility to be able to travel and go do things. And so uh, when we got married, we had our honeymoon at this um, all-inclusive in the Caribbean. And they have this whole chain of different resorts. Um, it's like a family of resorts on the different islands of the Caribbean. Okay. They have a bunch of different locations. Like and sandals or something yeah, like that? Okay. Yeah. And so um, the the people who get into that world, like it's kind of like a, a bucket list thing where they want to go to every single every resort. Lot. And so what they do, and, and even if they're not doing that, a lot of people are going there for honeymoons. And so this is going to be like the biggest trip of their lifetime or in the next 10 years. Yeah. And so they're trying to learn like, okay, is this like, we only, we've only got one shot at this. Is this the right resort for us? And so they love looking at the reviews of different resorts and like mm, all okay. the different activities. And they want to know if it really looks the way it does on the website. And so uh, Bryce and I had this idea of like, wow, wouldn't it be so cool to also kind of have like, not a side gig, but um, a side part of our brand of like just sharing like our travel experiences because that's something that we're really passionate about. Uh, and it, it just, it was super fun. And over time, those have continued to like perform well and I still get yeah. a lot of views on them, which is super funny. <laughs> um, but it doesn't do anything. Like yeah. it's one of those things where it was an interesting lesson to learn that virality doesn't always pay. And mm. In fact, my most viral videos, because I had another video on, on Instagram recently that I was telling you about that got like 13 million views. Uh, they don't do anything for you if they're not targeted to the right audience. And more often than not, like virality and high views can damage your personal brand more than support it. Isn't that weird? Yeah, I, I think like right now I'm, I'm seeing that a lot, a lot with YouTube shorts. Like I feel like every week, I'm like telling my clients, we need to be do doing more YouTube shorts. And then one week I'm like, these are like hurting your click through rate. They're, yeah. they're, 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 what's the word? They're skewing your results and your analytics and stuff like that. Um, so I think that, I, I think as new content is always being released and people are always refreshing what they want to talk about, um, there's always a little bit of that. And the, the, the danger of what something, you want something to go viral. But a lot of times people don't have that things in place to, Cap capitalize on right. what that virality was. So like if you're posting a ton of memes on a page of where you're wanting to talk about something else, if one of those memes goes viral, how are you cashing in on it if it's not going to go towards that altogether goal? Yeah. Like, like if you're a dog trainer and you made a meme about Dune, like <laughs> how is that going to connect? Right. And I think that a lot of people assume that the views will pay you. But even if you're on YouTube and you're monetizing through AdSense or whatever, like it is did you see that viral clip from Snoop? And he yeah. was saying how, man, I was looking at Spotify and it was my most oh, listened yeah. to stream and it paid me $80,000. So he had something like millions of, of streams yeah. on one of his most popular tracks. And I think the lifetime value of that was $80,000. And it's like, that might sound like, that is a lot of money objectively, but if you're looking to really cash in and make a legacy business and brand, like that's not going to do it. You have to have a way, like you say, to capture attention and monetize it. That's why we see so many of these really big creators on TikTok 
or even on Instagram and on YouTube that have massive audiences, but no way to monetize it. Yeah. And then once they do try to monetize it, it looks like a cash grab and they alienate their most important followers. Mm. That transition needs to be really delicate, which is yeah. why I help people do podcasts because I think that's a great way to do it. It is. Because it increases your curiosity and it also, um, you know, will give you, m what is, what's the word, more return on less investment, I think, when it comes to time and resources and all that. Anyways, we'll go down that rabbit hole another day because uh, I'm always talking about podcasts on whatever content I'm on or whatever platform I'm it's on. It's a relevant conversation for sure. It is, definitely. And I love that the algorithms are actually swaying back into long-form content. I mean, I've always watched video game streamers since I was in high school, and so I've always kind of known of, like, these people are, like, getting to know their viewers instantly um, because if you just watch an all-day stream, I know all everything about Dr. Disrespect or Tim the Tam and some of these names that are on it. And I'm like, why isn't other industries capitalizing on it? And then, and then I start seeing all these podcast clips, uh, all these different yeah. platforms. And I'm like, there it is. Someone connected it. Um, not the saying I was behind it because I didn't put any action, but I was thinking about it. Um, but I would argue this, though, back to your travel videos. I do think that actually maybe one day you could reach back into increasing travel into your brand because I do think that actually if somebody gets really obsessed with you, because this happens a lot on, on any platform, specifically yeah. YouTube. If they start just like binging all your videos, yeah. they'll go back and like all the way back to your journey. She goes, oh, so this person was doing a lot of travel back then and like their honeymoon videos. And and it kind of connects to um, what your relationship between you and Bryce and why it's such a cornerstone to your real estate business and why it's helped you build your coaching business in a little bit. I think that it kind of does add to it in a way. Not that it's like on a standalone thing that it's just like it's just there. I actually do think it it helps you in a way somebody see your journey a little bit. If the, do you think I, so? Yeah, I don't I don't remove any of my videos on my channel. So, um, I mean, you could say the exact same thing about the real garbage videos that I put up when I was still <laughs> yeah. learning how to yeah. film and edit my own videos, which was kind of a nightmare. Um, because I'm not a I'm not a video editor. I don't have the you know, a lot of people, when, when they think about like, oh man, it's just another cost. I should be lean and mean. If I'm going to create video, then I should be able to do it all by myself. But what you're missing is you're not saving the however much you're, you're paying somebody to help you per video. Mm -hmm. You're, you're missing out on the years of experience that that value gives you. Right. Yeah. And so like the, uh, travel videos were very like, um, what's the word when amateur? <laughs> amateur, yeah. Well, you're trying I'm something like, out. I'm like, what is that word when you don't know? But <laughs> it was amateur. They were like very amateur. And um, then I started getting into more of the the shorter form educational videos, where I was like, here's like three things that you need to do if you're gonna mm. buy a house, right? Those videos are so embarrassing. Mm. They are terrible. Half the time, my audio is not hooked up. So I'm like at my desk talking into a mic and you can clearly like see or hear that I forgot to turn the mic on, yeah. right? And Common. you can totally see that I'm like reading off of a, a script, right? A teleprompter because I had to do that in when I was still learning. Um, but I, I keep all of that stuff there because it is important for people to see like the entire journey. Like there wasn't one day where I just hopped up on YouTube and like decided I knew everything there was to know about everything and started sharing it. Sure. You know, I had to have I had to be that person who was posting every single week to 50 subscribers. And just hoping that at one point it would pop off. I love the idea that you're speaking to what is it? I try to tell this to a lot of people who are starting out that uh, if you can't be excited about speaking to you know, the five, 10 subscribers that you have, then you're never going to get to the talking to the big audience when you really, truly care. Yeah. So, uh, and you're at over 25,000 subscribers on YouTube, which is awesome, which is a huge accomplishment. I think the hardest to get over is probably, I'd say the first thousand. Yeah. I think it's probably the hardest. And then the next big step is like probably 20,000. Really? That's yeah. cool. I'd say, I'd say you can get to 10,000 pretty quick because you get excited about the thousand. You're like, keep going. Right. But- and then 5,000, I think, is also kind of hard. But I think 20, and then the next step is like 100. Mm -hmm. um, and once you – I'd say 100, every one of these is like a different ball game. Yeah. Um, like you said, you kind of have to keep refreshing your content and all that. So I know we're kind of helping – my company is kind of helping you shift your content strategy a little bit. We're in the middle of pivoting yeah. a lot of different moving pieces. Can you tell me about uh, a little bit of the new direction you're kind of heading in? Yeah. And um, how is, do you think it's going to help – 
your business altogether, your coaching business specifically, because that's kind of what you're in charge of. Okay, I'm a big believer in transparency, transparency, especially when it comes to monetization. Okay. So I'm going to share like like some specifics on that. Perfect. So from when I had 10,000 subscribers, I started working with you when I had 2,000. Okay. Maybe. Yeah, around there. I know you were over 1,000. So you're like, yeah. uh, at that point, I'm like, she's like one of our biggest clients. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like, that time we weren't working with anybody big on YouTube because we were just doing podcasts right. at that point. Well, and I was like, I, something's here. Like, like I'm starting to get clients with less, like 1,000 people. Sure. Like, the, I'm ready to invest and I want to make this a thing. Like, I'm going all in. Mm -hmm. And I, like, like you said, after a year and a half, got up to 10,000, I would say, from 10,000 to 20,000, I don't think I saw a significant shift in my revenue. There was not a big like, oh, she went from 10 to 20, so she tripled her revenue. That did not happen. Mm -hmm. That did not happen whatsoever. And so I just want to kind of put that out there because while it's super exciting, like, again, it, it really comes down to the entire funnel. And, and I promise I have a point. So it's I'm looking at the entire funnel and you're bringing in the audience from the higher level content that you're creating, like the top of the funnel, and then you're warming them up and then going in for the sale. So where I really struggle with is the sale. Gotcha. Because I am an educator at heart. I'm a coach. And most of my content at this point is coaching content. I'm teaching. I'm saying these are the things you need to do. And what I found was between 10,000 and 20,000 subs, I was still teaching, but I wasn't selling. And mm. so because of that, I wasn't seeing a big increase in my revenue and in sales. Um, I was seeing an increase in my in my brand credibility, absolutely. And obviously my audience was growing, which was fantastic. But I was creating content that was so instructional that my uh, audience was good. They're like, you know what? This, this is free content. She's giving me so much value and I'm busy implementing the tips that she's getting me, mm -hmm. like giving me. And what I was missing was that like deeper form of content, right? Which is why we started pivoting into the more long form podcast. Okay. And what I found that that is going to allow us to do and what the hope is, it's all an experiment. Yeah. Right. Like it's always just every being, content is an experiment. It's always being creative and being curious. Right. And so like, how can we change things up a little bit? And, and after creating the same kind of content for years, we decided let's really shake it up and maybe pull out a little bit of the educational content, cut that amount in half and really start filming more of that long form podcast style content and then parsing it up for the other videos where we need like that medium to short form content. Right. And again, like when you and I had that conversation and you kind of presented that to me, it made so much mm. sense. And it also made me feel really excited about content again, because how many times could you say like the three tips that you need to whatever? Yes. Like yes. I'm, I'm tired of telling people what they need to do. They need to just do it. They have all the information on the internet. Like that's a big thing. I think when it comes to content creation, like there is so much information on the internet. How are you going to activate your audience? Mm. Like it's about how are you going to activate them to take action either on their own or reaching out to you for assistance so that again, you can monetize the content that you're putting out. Um, the other part of that too is like, it's not just about creating content that sells. It's also about helping your audience be empowered to take action because what we find is when you're creating a lot of the same content over and over again, and now you have me on a soapbox. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, I you're good. This, this is good. I was, I'm like, I'm already like, there's so much to unpack here. Like that we can talk really uh, that, in depth well, about so a lot Well, that's what's so cool about this content. Yeah. We can actually have a yeah. conversation about it. When, when you're creating the same kind of like four to five to seven to 10 minute video, like you're, you're just kind of heaping on ideas and what you may find if you are in my position is your audience can't do a lot with that because they, as soon as they like can process the first idea, you're posting the next idea and then the next idea. If you're on the post schedule that I'm on and I have some creators in my niche who post every single day, which is awesome. Right. Yeah. And they're like bite sized actionable posts. But at some point you have to have like the deeper conversation like this that shows you the why behind the action that gives you real context behind what the possibilities are to actually get them out of information gathering mode and to actually 
taking strides towards their goals. And I think that when you can do that with really well-crafted content, then you are actually able to not only establish your authority in your niche, but you're able to like inspire action, which people will always pay for either in giving you their attention or giving you their money. Yeah. I, so th- a lot of good stuff there. Um, I think I, I talked a lot, a little bit about this in the solo podcast I recorded a couple of days ago, where I kind of broke down other forms of media that you could be doing marketing wise or, 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 uh, building your following or whatever personal brand, whatever it may be. So I broke down like short form, medium form for YouTube videos, blog, even like blog posts I mentioned a little bit. Um, and then I talked about the value of doing podcasts mm-hmm. and, you talked about a little bit of the subject matter of like burnout to an extent. Yeah. And I think what's really big on YouTube right now is like, why are all these YouTubers quitting? I feel like there's been a in- big influx of like all across like the gaming world to like the business world and people just like, yeah. do I want to keep making the same content? Um, Cause I, I see people on Instagram and YouTube that were at a point where posting maybe a video a day that was highly edited. And then on Instagram, they're doing like three to five videos a day, which that's no, crazy. That's and if you're not building out the team to, which is hard to build a team and scale that is yeah. is a whole another thing you got to talk about because you got to hire editors, you got to teach them how to do it, you got to teach people to find content in your content. It's a whole another beast. But these people that are doing it for so long, they burn out and they're like, okay, do I want to keep doing this for the long term? And then you know, they, a lot of times they grow, their families grow, they find other responsibilities they want to take on. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that you touched on that podcasting can, I, I think I mentioned a little way out uh, and in the other episode is that it could be a way out, so to say, yeah. of diversifying um, what you're creating. And so it increases your curiosity because yeah. you can have conversations that, like we talked about doing for a second, you know, in this, in this manner, in a YouTube video, it's like, give me the three tips now and get out, you know, <laughs> which is great. It's yeah. great for that type of content. Or like pros and cons moving to a certain city and get out, you know, uh-huh. you're in and out. And in short form, it's like, what's the most like crazy shock factor and then putting it into a short. So what podcasting lets you do is it not only will give you that content to cut up, but it also will increase that ability for you to kind of, you know, revive your passion to create a little bit. Yeah. I think that you experience that a little bit because you're like, I don't just have to talk about the same thing over and over and over again, even though some experts say you figure out what works and just do that over and over and over again. You can't do that over a decade or five years. You you really can't. You really can't because like while you while your audience is constantly going through some kind of a churn, right? It like, like a churn rate is is gonna be a factor yeah. of that for sure. sure. You're gonna have people exiting the industry and people coming into the industry um that you are trying to serve. That is gonna happen. But at some point the consumer interest shifts consumer behavior shift. And so when you are a creator, you, you have to take responsibility for understanding when that happens and pivoting to meet the needs. Yeah. We're, we're creating for two reasons. We're creating to serve and we're creating to serve our, our own curiosity factor. Right. And so part of that too is like, yeah, you can create all the actionable tips in the world, but if you're acting like Dr. Google, (laughs) Like yeah. you're not having a, you're not giving yourself the chance to let your passion shine through. And I think that that's really important for people to see. Like people don't want to just be talked at. They don't want to be like preached at. They want to have a conversation. And one thing that you said is being able to shift that longer form content and really go more in depth. I think the other thing it allows you to do is it allows you to simplify kind of like you were saying, yeah. it does allow you to just kind of like scale back a little bit. But the key is it allows you to do that without sacrificing impact. Yeah. And you might actually see a huge return in everything, in client engagements, in the click-through, in the people who are interested in buying your products. Because now you're not just a preachy know-it-all telling people what to do or giving like the three new tips, sure. trying to be clickbaity, which is helpful for sure. There's a purpose for that. But again, look at the funnel. Like, what are we doing with the funnel? If you're only creating that short form video designed for virality, you're never going to be able to extend the invitation for people to go deeper. Mm. Right. And and I think that we have to be looking at it in that way and understanding what kind of content we're creating and how it's serving us. Mm. And we also want to get paid, too. Cause then I, and I think that uh, something that we're also seeing a shift in is that uh, there's so many like I, I was listening to podcasts this morning and they're talking about 
um, the, the joke that if you see a Facebook ad, it's just like, oh, it's just salesy spammy. Like this person's just, you know, what, there's so many ads that we see on a daily basis. And so one thing that I think the value of, of if you are trying to increase what you're trying to make on financially, like let's say you want to sell, you know, coaching or you want to sell something as small as like something on Etsy, like a, like a PDF of like how to, you know, I don't know, full paper. I don't know, whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, doing ads works. Like it, it, that's, a, that's a thing that's been around for a very long time. But you also are in a world that people want to know you beyond that wall yeah. of your business. And I think that's why we've seen a huge um, increase of people saying you need to have a personal brand. You need to have a personal brand. Yeah. Um, and for people who are on YouTube and already, they're already kind of doing that. Like a YouTube creator that already has like 100,000 subs who already knows that they have a personal brand going, even though maybe their name isn't the name of the channel. That's still them. But I think that what a podcast or at least a long form piece of content can do is increase that something that you say all the time is that low, that what is it? The like, no like and trust factor, right? Yeah, uh-huh. Um, you say that a lot in the real estate teaching world, but I think that goes for, for business altogether. I think that something that a long form video does is that you can just sit in the room and be a fly on the wall and to kind of listen to that person really deeply yeah. about not just their expertise in something, but also you get to know a little bit about their their passions and how they talk, how they communicate, um, what movies they like, if they reference it, or how, you know their families. And like for you, you talk about reaching your target um, niche for not just real estate, but like let's say your real estate clients that maybe your husband works with who works more on the real estate side. It's a lot of those move up buyers and yeah. it's families and it's growing. It's and so uh, to do that, you have to showcase that you have a family. Yeah, you uh, yeah, because right. you want to relate with them. Showcase that you have kids. You want to showcase that you know you and your husband are married, and that you kind of went through the same experience that a lot of these other people want to go through. And a lot of times, it's really hard to do that, even though you do accomplish it through like carousel posts and um, a lot of the posting. Other people may have a hard time doing that because it takes a lot of work. Mm-hmm. But what a podcast can do is help break that barrier pretty easily because you're you're going to talk about what you love and what you've gone through and your experiences. And I think a podcast can really help people just pretty much get plugged in so much easier into that. Yeah. Would you Would you agree on that? I would. And the other part of it, too, that that we can't forget is like we're, we're talking a lot about the consumer facing side of things. Right. How is our content interacting with the consumer or the audience? But we also have to consider how we are interacting with the content that we're creating. Yeah. And for a lot of um, for a lot of business owners, when they think of content creation, they can't buy into it, even though it would hugely benefit their their business. Like you take any any really skilled business owner, like let's just use my niche, real estate agents. If we have a high producing real estate agent who's doing really well, who's mostly referral based, they're closing like 20 to 30 deals a year, which is like objectively a very high producer in most markets. I mean, over 50% of realtors and there's 1.5 million of them in the US sold a deal or less. Okay. last year. Okay. So like if you are closing deals consistently, you're among the 1% top producers in my industry. They are at risk of being passed over by the new fresh faces coming into the industry who have less experience, mm-hmm. who have less care, who have less know-how, but who understand how to connect with their people on a deeper audience or on a deeper level rather. And so most people know like multiple different realtors. Most people know multiple different lawyers. Most people know multiple different mechanics. Like it doesn't matter what it is, but the the person who's going to win is the person who does a couple of things. Number one, like you said, really instills that no like and trust factor. But to do it, you have to buy into that. You have mm-hmm. to understand the importance of articulating to them why they should hire you over your competition and what podcasting allows you to do or any form of content creation really. But I would argue that long form content like podcasting allows you to do this a lot faster and more effectively and more efficiently. What it allows you to do is process and say the same thing over and over again until you absolutely nail it. 
Mm. There's Ooh. there's something that happens in long form content creation where we're having this conversation. Yeah. I am going to be better after this conversation because of you generously creating a platform for me to talk because of the 30 minutes of time that I've been talking nonstop and being able to process these things that are really important to me. But sometimes I have a trouble writing them down on a blank page. Mm. And what that's going to do is I'm going to be able to take that onto the next video I create and have a more, a, a higher sense of conviction, a smoother delivery, whether I'm creating content or whether I'm speaking to somebody face to face, trying to get a new client. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I like the idea. It's kind of training you to be yeah, a better communicator in at sales, marketing, whatever it may be for your business. Absolutely. And think about think about real estate agents right now. Like mm -hmm. again, my niche, I'm going to talk about what I know. Sure, right? sure, absolutely. So, real estate agents, let's say they're mostly referral based. Okay. Fantastic. They don't have to sell. They don't have to really even market because they have all these other, you know, past clients and friends and family who know why they're the best doing it for them. They hear the word house and they say, you got to you got to reach out to the Lugos. They helped us buy and sell. They are mm -hmm. amazing. Just trust me. I don't even know what they did well, but all I know is that I felt really good after the sale and you're going to feel really good, too. Done. Like there's no hard sell. And my job is to show up at that point and do what I do best. Okay. But what happens when I'm creating content and somebody sees a great video that looks polished and professional and it says three three things you need to know before you buy and sell in Phoenix. Where is that factor of the person on their shoulder saying you've got to hire this person? You're not going to get it in a 5 minute like in and out, you know, quick quick yeah. tip video. You're going to get it through your exposure to that person really going deep on these ideas that really matter. And the more you're having those conversations on this type of a format, the easier it's going to be. So like, I, I, I think that we have to also be thinking of like, how are we constantly sharpening the blade? Mm. Long form podcasting, like there's not, there's not much of a better opportunity to do it than that. Yeah. I think you also touched on something that kind of got my brain going is you talk about a content strategy because you mentioned that if you see a video that kind of instructs you about you know information about what you to be aware of like the other day i i saw a loan officer here in the area that did a post about um heloc and uh -huh. all that stuff and because i eventually i want to do that move up eventually and so i was like oh that's a great option i don't know who that, that person was talking about i saved it the video and then sent it to my wife but we still had no interest in who that person was. It yeah. was all about the information. Oh, my God. And that was yes. a 30-second spurt. And I was like, that was great knowledge. I don't care who that is. And so I think about that person's page. Let's say I go to it. That video probably performed really well. Sure. Could maybe like 500000 a million if it's like doing you know what it's supposed to be doing. But let's say the rest of their content was kind of the same thing or – even more backed up and maybe it was just like posts about other stats and why you should be doing certain things. They're only educating, right? Yeah. If there is nothing else to lean me in to be like, Oh, this is maybe a scenario of why this person should be doing it. Or even a deeper dive into maybe that video that I saw, I didn't see any clips of anything else other than that to, to, to supplement that mm -hmm. and to lean me in more and cash me in as a, maybe a community follower. Yeah. And so uh, for people that are already content creating, which is probably a lot of people on this podcast, um, if you're just doing one thing, you know, which is, you know, the fun thing to do to get all the views. But if you're not doing anything else to lean people in, I think you're going to miss out, which we kind of talked about it a little bit earlier, which was cashing on it. But from a content schedule perspective, um, there's a danger there if you're not, if you're kind of the vi virality of it, that's a hard word to say. Virality. Vi virality. Yeah. Um, but see, you're practicing. I, I am. I am. I'm, I'm sharpening. You're which sharpening the blade. I love that point that you made that podcasting, even though it may make you solid content. Like if you're coming yeah. to my studio, you're going to get solid quality content. Um, but it's also sharpening you. And I love that idea yeah. of iron, iron sh sharpens iron. You're going to have um, a networking opportunity as well. Continue circulating people on your show, whether they're just people in your industry, could just be somebody like your, even if like you want to go down your best friend, 
you know, yeah. um, talking on a microphone, you're going to sharpen each other uh-huh. and you're going to get sharpened to, again, be better, but also increase that networking aspect of it because you're going to deeper dive. Like I'm getting to know you a lot better doing this, doing this interview, and understanding how you got to where you wanted to be. Um, and I wouldn't have done that throughout a deep dive conversation podcast wise. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, that was really I just I just totally didn't think about that, that podcasting because I, I I think we both have talked about this a little bit. We're both introverts in a way. Yeah. And, um, and we like to tinker. Yes. We get really passionate about, about something tinkering. and we just. Like, I can't tell yeah. you how many times my studio has moved around. Every time somebody <laughs> yeah. comes in, it's like maybe a little different. And maybe well, I, I just came different. in and I'm like, okay, give me the tour. <laughs> yeah. I've been here. It's always, <laughs> I've it's been here always times, but give me the tour. Exactly. I think I'd be, if I went down the W2 route, I'd be a great just studio manager. Cause I'd be like, oh, I always want to make sure it's everything is yeah. perfect always. And that would be like my full time. It's so satisfying. But of course, I'm called to be a little bit better yeah. and more, different. not better, but different. Yeah. Achieve You're called more. down a different yeah. route. Um, but we're both introverts to that to that way, and we love tinkering with things. How have you overcome? Actually, well, I would say podcasting probably has helped you probably overcome a little bit of that and how to communicate better on camera, even though you didn't do podcasts for the first couple of years of content creating, right? I don't know. I, uh, I Because I'm very introverted, I can, I can compartmentalize. Okay. really well so and, and I had to learn that so like the first time that I did video um <laughs> I I have to so so I have to tell this story tell it tell it when we got into real estate okay it was 2014 2015 okay and when you're in when you get into real estate you don't know jack shit about anything like okay. yes you have to take all the hours of like the classes you have to pass the test which I heard is complete you won't use any of it. You won't use any of it. It is less helpful to your success than like a generic communications degree that can be used anywhere. Right. Like, like it is so, which, which, which I am a college dropout, so I don't have anything, you know, it's not like I can even say anything about it. Most honestly, most entrepreneurs (laughs) and business owners are. Oh yeah. So it's kind of I'm like the poster child yeah. for like like quit it and move <laughs> on to something else. Um, so I so we get into real estate, okay. right? And we we like show up and we're like, okay, where's the houses to sell? It's not like that at all. Mm-hmm. And so we found uh, we we connected with this uh, more seasoned professional, mm-hmm. more seasoned real estate agent at the time. He was probably in his fifties. And it, I'm sorry, Rick, I don't know how old you are. It was Rick McCone. <laughs> okay. Rick McCone, you should check him out. He's an incredible YouTuber. Um, Rick, he, I'm going to come subscribe. Yeah, he he's a, definitely check him out. He, um, for anyone of that generation who's like, I'm too old to film or I don't know, I don't know how to learn something new. Go follow Rick and then talk to me because mm-hmm. this guy is curious and creative and he comes up with new things and he tries them and it, it's not to wow. like like he's so like definitely check him out he goes Where's live he on, located is here. He here is he he's here, here. Oh. and he goes live on youtube every single day oh and he awesome. just live stream i know and he just talks about the market and his live streams have like over a thousand views in three hours like I'm, I'm not kidding but he was consistent and he's always been just curious and so he taught us how to do the point of my my thing he taught us how to do um, an open house, right? And so we show up day one and we meet him. He's in our brokerage. And like we really connected with him and he really kind of took us under his wing and like showed us showed us the ropes. Okay. Um, so he he teaches us how to do our first open house. He teaches us how, how to do a lot of like those first things um, in terms of like how to how to get clients as a real estate agent. And because he has his passion for filming. He's like, you guys really need to do video. And at the time, it's like 2014, 2015. This is almost 10 years ago now. And we're like, what are you talking about, Rick? Like, what I don't like like mm-hmm. video for what, for who? Like, what does this look like? And so at the time, uh, Facebook streaming was just getting up to be a big thing. Like Facebook Live, creating video and posting it to Facebook was really catching on. And so he said, look, I'm going to set up a green screen in the office. I'm going to set up my camera. All you guys have to do is just show up and like, let's just have fun with it. And so he taught us how to do video for the first time and how to like stand there and do video. And we had some other people who were getting into it at that time, too, who helped us. But uh, the first experience we had was with Rick kind of showing us like what it could look like. And so I'm introverted. I don't want to do any of this. 
but I'm really good at compartmentalizing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he goes, okay, three, two, one. And then now we're going to hit record. And I was just able to like, like shift into that persona. It's like Sasha Fierce with Beyonce. Only I'm like, <laughs> like not Beyonce at all okay. or Fierce or Sasha. Yeah. Um, I'm more like just, you know, okay. Boom. And I like move into like that alternate persona. And I was like, okay, now I'm speaking to the camera. And like, this is just me having a conversation, like Mm -hmm. super dialed in. And I didn't know that I could do that. Like Mm -hmm. I had no idea that I was able to just like turn on my like film talking face. But I'm really good at that. Like I am really good at turning off like the inner dialogue. And it's because like at that point we were committed. We were going to do whatever it took. And if it meant like learning how to come on video because like like be on video and talk and have a conversation and if that was going to be my ticket not to cold call or swindle people out of their homes because that was disgusting to me like yeah. that was what I was going to do. And so part of it is taking a little bit of responsibility over your business and deciding this is what I need to do to be successful. We got to turn off that inner critic because it doesn't know anything anyways. Sure. And I'm just going to be curious about how this goes. And so that's when I started really creating YouTube videos for real estate okay. on my channel. And so like we had this experience with Rick. This was probably 2016 now, 2015, 2016. I start creating YouTube videos and I was doing them by myself. And it was like kind of a disaster. It was, not good. It was like really embarrassing, <laughs> like I said. Um, but I'm creating them. I'm putting them up, them up on YouTube. And I start sharing a little bit of what I'm finding with other real estate agents And I shared one video where I was talking about Instagram because at the time what we were really producing well with was Instagram. Like we were earning multiple six figures GCI on Instagram alone. Wow. Just not from paying ads, not from doing anything, but just like documenting what we were doing in our business and getting clients organically that way. Mm -hmm. And um, it was fantastic. Like such a beautiful way of just connecting with real people and doing business. And so I thought like, how can I transfer this to YouTube and just kind of like scale out a little bit? And so I started sharing a little bit about what we were doing um, with other real estate agents and um, one video popped off and it got like a thousand or 2000 views. And I was like, whoa, like at the time I was like, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. And now it's like still, it still gets views like all these years later and stuff. But that's when I was like, you know what? I need to go like even deeper because like I'm halfway trying right now. It's still uncomfortable. It's not fun. Like I would dread filming days because I was doing it all myself. I'd kick Bryce out of the house. I'd say, go show houses (laughs) or whatever you're doing today. I'm going to film. And I would set up my DSLR and my teleprompter. And I would put myself in my kitchen and I would just like have conversations and with the camera and I would film those. I would edit them and put them up. And it would take me like eight to 10 hours. The most dreadful part was actually filming because I'm introverted. Right. Yeah. But, like, the tinkering part was super fun. And yeah. I was, like, having a lot of fun with it, even though it was terrible. Yeah. Um, the, the end product was just, like, laughable. I don't know how, like, people started following me on Instagram. Because, like, some of that – I guess the content was good. Well. The content was good, right? Yeah. So, like, it didn't even matter that, like, the, the production value was absolute, like, yeah. garbage. Um, but the content was good. I was connecting with people. And that's when I was, like, okay, I need to actually take this seriously – in order for me to be consistent and take it seriously, I've got to hire somebody. And that's when I hired you. So one thing about podcasting that I love, and it, we kind of talked about it a little bit earlier, but the, and I said it many different ways, <laughs> but it's, it's uh, the value of return on investment yeah. when it comes to not so much the exact ROI, but when it comes to your time, your energy, um, all that stuff because you get a lot out of a podcast like we've already discussed and we both have families. And I think that podcasting can be a really great way to balance your life out a little bit. And uh, for me, if I wanted to do YouTube videos right now and teach how to, set up microphones or do all these things and create these highly edited videos. Because I think if you're doing YouTube videos, they probably need to be retention based. So they need a lot more work to it because someone's going to sit and watch it versus just listen. Uh, That's going to be a lot of work. It's a lot of time. It's going to be a lot. And where I got to hire an editor and that's some more time energy to teach editor and resources to go towards that. 
And so it's one thing that podcasts do is they do open that can of worms of like, well, I can get a little more out of this and be home to like pick up my kids from school and say goodnight and um, stuff like that. So I think this is the greatest benefit actually of doing a podcast is it lets you have a personal life if you add it to your strategy and maybe like replace it with some really intense filming aspects or yeah. or the grind of like creating a sh- three shorts a day or going out and filming like cinematic B-roll somewhere. Uh, podcasts just kind of force you to just sit and get it done in like an hour or two. And you're yeah. like, great. And now I can go home and maybe you have an editor that can take care of it. And so like Joe Rogan, if you take for example, he just sits and has convos. He doesn't handle any of his editing. But if he just sits and has convos, then he gets to go home and be with his family, work out, have the be the UFC person that he is. Mm-hmm. Uh, so for you, I know you recently switched to podcasting um, a little bit more intense. So you've been doing a podcast for some time, yeah. but you've recently um, added it to your strategy and leaned into it a little bit more. How maybe altogether podcasting from that you've done entirely – have you seen it help you become a little bit better at balancing out uh, your personal life with having two kids and a husband and also being a real estate agent on the side and a business coach for real estate agents? Do you think, do you think you could just like, um, let's say, would it hurt you to just drop it? Would it help you to lean into it more? What, what do you think, what have you learned that it's helped you with in that retrospect? Well, <laughs> It, it does come down to like, who are we talking about? Look at the goals and what are they looking to accomplish? So I, I think that one thing that I'm noticing, and this made me very excited to get into more long form podcast type content. I think people are like kind of over the highly edited polished content right Mm. and and that's not to say there isn't a place for it because i'm not giving that away right like we're still doing some of that content on my channel and it's going to perform just as fine as it always has sure but i think people are really craving authenticity people are craving the let's sit down and have a conversation while you have your coffee you know what i mean like while while you're drinking your coffee (laughs) and so (laughs) Mm. so like cheers right cheers (laughs) so when when i'm thinking about that how can we look at that and turn it into a benefit? A benefit for them, giving them what they want, which is more authenticity, but a benefit for us of like, okay, now we have the permission not to go ham on high production um, content that requires a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of money. How can we sit down and do an hour of talking and 10x that into a month's worth of content? You absolutely can do that. And so for me, we've been doing this for a month or two. I'm still learning where we're going to have that 10x, right? So again, there's the aspect of like, let's be a little bit of a scientist about it. Like we're not going to nail it the first time. Let's like create content, create these podcasts. And as we learn how this format settles into the overall content strategy, how can we leverage that into less film time in yeah. general. And so that actually did happen this week, right? Where I reached out to you or you reached out to me on Monday and you said, Hey, okay, Steph. So we're doing our recording on Wednesday. Um, want to make sure you're all set. want to make sure you have everything you need. Like you're, you're good with the plan. How can I support you? And I was like, yeah. So like, I mean, what do we have coming up? Like what, <laughs> yeah. what, 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 what do we have in yeah. the, in the pipeline for content? Like where are we at? Because we batch a lot of the content. And you're like, yeah, I have a, a, you know, a clip going out from a podcast that you had a guest with a couple of weeks ago. And I was like, that is so funny. I, we did that a month ago. Yeah, that interview was in February. Yeah. yeah, it was a month ago. It's just as relevant then as it is today. today. But we get to kind of get even more leverage out of it by putting that slot into a regular posting um, schedule that we yeah. already have. And so from that instance, I was like, wow, that's really cool. And so what I want to get to is like right now we're filming twice a month because we're still learning this new cadence. And again, we're figuring it out. Like I'm not I was under no pretext that we were going to nail it right off the bat. I want to learn this process. I want to do it the right way. I'm going to give it the time it needs to take. I can see this. I can see this reducing a lot of the time that I'm filming but giving, getting even more content over time from yeah. it. And I'm already starting to see that. 
Is yeah. that is that kind of what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, I'd say leverage. Yeah. It helps you leverage yourself because like So let me let me actually give you a really good example. Perfect. Set it. Let me give you a good example. So I had my second baby in um November of twenty twenty two. And I reached out to you in September and I was like, yo, we got to like, you know, start getting this content. So um, we filmed, I think, 16 YouTube videos. Over the span of like two weeks. Because you came in twice. Yeah, I did. And also I was like a mess. Like the the whole pregnancy, I was not like, that was not a pregnancy where I could like bang it out. Like the first pregnancy I could have, the second one almost like killed me. It was not cool. Sure. Uh, it was not pretty. And so um, we had to take our time over the span of, of a couple of film sessions, and we built up a bank of 16 videos. Is there a world where I could have come in for one three-hour film session and mm. just had a conversation with you for three hours, which easily I can talk for three hours? And could that have given us 16 video clips? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that short could form have. clips. Yeah. And the reels and the TikToks and everything else. Yeah. Absolutely. So like the idea that creating a lot of content has to be very time consuming, very costly, very uh, energy sucking is a complete fallacy because look at what we're doing right now. Yeah. This is going to create two podcast episodes for us because I'm going to ask you for this too, <laughs> that, we're, that <laughs> sure. we can put on my podcast Ab- absolutely. <laughs> because it's such a great yeah. content. Um, and like you're asking really good questions and it's relevant to both of our audiences Think of how much short form content this is going to get. And we're also going to be able to parse this out into like shorter meteor videos if if you decide to. Yeah. Like it's a no brainer. We have to start thinking in terms of um, like how can we scale? And scalability means putting the same or less effort in for a greater return. Hmm. It doesn't get better than this type of format. Yeah. I think you touched on it. It's scalability. I think. Yeah. Ever since I started my business, I'm like, how can I scale this? How can I scale this? How can I scale this? And I've, you, you, you know, I've, I've chopped a couple services, mm-hmm. started new services, lost money on those services, went back to <laughs> doing other things. Yeah. Um, but one thing I think, uh, I think all of us want is to um, scale something that, you know, is reasonable. Well, and I want to acknowledge you for that, Zeke, because when you um, are starting a business, the first five years of it, truly, in my opinion, is – just testing and it's just being curious and trying a bunch of things and seeing what sticks and the businesses that fail are the ones that go all in and when they decide they have to pivot they look at that pivotal moment and think i failed and that's my ticket to get out Mm. and you don't do that you say how can we continue to try things differently until we get it right yeah and find the perfect combination of um you know of, of value for everybody involved. Mm-hmm. And you have to have that, that, yeah. that mindset when you're a business owner. And again, it's taking responsibility for learning what is going to work for you. And so for you, if you're looking to work with YouTubers or like, you know, these people who have audiences who are, who are on that content treadmill and they're sick of saying the same thing and creating yeah. the same kind of content and they just want to talk about the thing that they're passionate about. Like, this is a no-brainer. Yeah. It's a no-brainer, but they have to have the responsibility to try something new. Yeah. They have to take responsibility to say, you know what, this maybe isn't as sustainable in this season, or it's just not working as well as it has the last five to seven years. I need to try something different. Mm, yeah. Well, you pretty much just pitched my my personal brand right there. What, I, <laughs> what I'm trying to you know educate people on is why podcasts can really help you if you're already creating content. So last thing we'll talk about really quick um, is our families. Yeah. And so a funny story or a funny background is that we pretty much had our kids um, very similar. Yeah. And she has two boys. I have two girls. Uh-huh. I think mine are always like two months younger than yours, yeah. right? Pretty much on the dot, which I think is it's just interesting. So when we come in and film, we always talk about what's the latest with your kids. Is there any funny stories and whatnot? So – can you tell me what like what's a the latest funny story that you've had with your two boys? Any anything interesting that you just like it could just or it could be a low moment of like, you know, they didn't sleep at all last night and they were, you know, I have a couple of funny ones I'll share once, oh, once you give me something. Well, they definitely don't sleep. <laughs> um, <laughs> they don't sleep when you want them yes, to, right? They don't want you to. So so I'm I'm I feel like we're both lucky because like we've got we've got a pretty sweet setup. Like our kids like like so grateful to have healthy yes, kids absolutely like no complications thus far i mean knock on wood hopefully that that remains the same but um 
going to two kids may have been like may as well have been going to 10 mm. like it it is so much more work having to and the other day i was putting, i love your podcast with with your older kid with holland yeah, with holland so Crazy. cute so my older kid grady is very similar uh he's gonna be four in a month and he is like he is so cute he's very uh, very grounded, very curious, always asking questions, mom, 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 always asking mm. questions and always so observant. And so the other day I was putting Graham down, my my one-year-old, I was putting him down and Graham is like a spitfire. He's the opposite of Grady. That kid has not been chill a day in his life. <laughs> like he he's just like a a psycho in, in a really fun way. And he just, he, um anywhere we go, He's like he has like this gravitational pull to anybody who's paying attention. Yeah. They just get sucked into his energy because they're like, oh, my gosh, he's so sweet. And then he turns around and he's like a spitfire. He's yeah. nuts. So I'm putting Graham down to bed. Graham's screaming because he doesn't want to go to bed because he knows Big Brother is playing out there. But I'm like, bro, you, like you need to nap. You're yeah. insane. And so I'm putting him down and I'm singing him the little song that I sing them before they go to sleep. And he's crying and I go out and I close the door and Grady's like, man, I think he doesn't like your voice either, mom. <laughs> <laughs> he's on the other side of the house. He, he, he took the time to walk over there he's, and he, to share his thought process. He hears, he hears Graham crying. He hears me singing. He's like, he's like, that's not it. Mom. <laughs> that's <laughs> like, so funny. But it's like that always. Like mm -hmm. there's never a moment of just like being just of, of peace. Yeah. And like, that's not to say there's not love happening at the same time. Like it's yeah. all love and funny and also, but I'm just like, wow, these kids humble you. Yeah. Oh, humbly. I, every time I pick up my daughter from daycare, she goes, oh, it's dad. Where's mom? Yeah. Every time. And then she'll, sometimes she'll even cry on the way home because that mom didn't pick her up. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, great. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. I, I just make it a point to try to pick them up every day. That forces me out of the studio. So like I make it like I put a lot of effort into it. And then as soon as I get there, I'm like, mm, all right. Is uh -huh. it worth it? But it always will be um, in the long term. But I think a funny story for me. So this isn't really a funny story. I think it's more of a, I like to pat myself on the back for it. Okay. So uh, I'm recently. I'm here for that. Yeah. I like, you know, parenting sharpens you. Just like, <laughs> like, just like podcasting does. And so my wife's going out of town. Okay. And sh she's actually going on a Disneyland trip with her best friend. And they're taking my oldest. Okay. Okay. So they're going like a girl's trip. Even though everyone in my family but me is a girl. My my baby is also – my one-year-old now is also a girl, but she wasn't going. I was staying home with her. Uh -huh. So this weekend, I'm, I'm, I was going to do baby duty. And up to this point, our – I mean, you know this. Co-sleeping is a thing and and balancing out – every kid's a little bit different on how, where they need to sleep and up until a point. So um, my second is much more of touchy and has to be touching us while we sleep. Um, and so she would sleep in the crib and like at one in the morning, we just couldn't put her back down. So yeah. she'd have to come into the bed with us. And so she got used to that and we're it's both a slippery slope. It is friend. a slippery slope. <laughs> and so for all your moms listening to this, I'm not trying to start a war about opinions and how to parent. This is just what we did. And I learned from it. Yeah. And, uh, she's going on this girl's trip and my wife was like really worried for me because usually two parents can kind of be like a wall for right. someone to walk, move up. So she made me move a mattress out into the living room, lay it on the floor, and just in case to be ready if she's not going to sleep in the crib. Can I just take a minute? What an amazing mom. Because co-sleeping, like you do have to make sure that you're like taking yeah. steps to be safe. Like, yeah. kudos, you guys. Kudos. So you, she, you guys she knew what she was going on. Oh, yeah. You guys, you guys got this. Okay. Yeah. So she's going out of town in the back of my brain – I'm like, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna. Oh I'm no! Gonna, <laughs> I'm, gonna I'm gonna put my I'm gonna put my foot down, out. and I'm gonna teach this baby to sleep in the crib. That's what <laughs> that's what I did. So I didn't tell my wife I had this pre-planned. I said I figured this out oh, accidentally. No. So the first night she goes, I like tell her I'm gonna move the mattress out. I didn't lie. I just said I was planning on kind of doing it right, just right. in case, like maybe I just absolutely just fell and yeah. failed at this. So I the first night. I just make this commitment. I move the crib into the other bedroom, and I, I had to take off the doors. It was like this big construction kind of thing. And she's gone. She's gone. I'm oh home alone. This is the first night. I move her in there. I, I kind of instigated her to buy the baby monitor that she wanted because I'm uh -huh. like, let's just do it now. We have the money to do it. 
um, I set up the baby monitor, the new one. How old is also- baby at this point? Oh, she's nine months. Okay, okay. No, she's not a newborn. So, right so you're like, no, we're no, doing no, this. No, this is this is to the point where like, yeah, this baby's big enough to make our bed feel like there's a person sleeping. Right, in it. right. And you know, obviously, if the baby's in your bed consistently, it just hurts your relationship with your wife. You just don't have that. You know, yeah. like we watch TV. In and bed you know a lot what? And... You don't even have to. Yeah, it's it's a personal yeah, it's choice. A... You're like looking to your family and what's going to so, work for you guys. So I'm I made this commitment. I moved the crib in there. And the very first night, it's like you know, it's getting to bedtime. I'm, I'm like prepping emotionally. And I'm like gearing myself <laughs> up. I'm like I'm gonna have to fight tonight. So I'm like setting myself up to like. Um, watch a scary movie or something to kind of keep like to drown out the noise if she's gonna cry because we did sleep training with our first and the first the first week was hard so it yeah. was a lot of crying. Um, I put her down in the crib, made it super dark, and um, ever since then sleeps through the night, <laughs> just instantly. Kids, dude. And I'm just like, oh, okay, I figured it out. She just needed to be in her own room in the dark with the sound machine. Never once cries through the night anymore. Wait. It just worked. She was sleeping in your room in a crib. I just moved the crib in a different room. How often are we creating our own problems for these kids? Exactly. Exactly. That is so crazy. But you know what is so funny? The same thing happened with my baby. Because he had crazy colic. and, And I would try to bring him into our bed. And he would be fighting us the whole time because yeah. he's like he's like our he's like our don't touch me baby like he doesn't want like okay he different a, reasons to bring him into the bed but. he is a touch baby but he like he he's he he doesn't like anything like on his body he really needs like space okay and so he wouldn't stay in our bed he wouldn't stay in the freaking bassinet and finally at four months I was like you know what kid like <laughs> you nothing get to that point no I know you're, t- you're and and that was yeah. where you were too yeah. where I was like I was like nothing's making you happy. Go to your own bed. Uh-huh. Go to your own crib. Go in your own room. So, I, and I didn't even have the nursery set up. So I set up the nursery, put him in there. I never even had to sleep train him. He was like, "That's all I wanted was to get away from you yeah. for eight hours, for twelve hours, so I can yeah. sleep." And he never had a sleep regression. Didn't have to sleep train him. Put him in there. What and me? I think the reason for mine was she couldn't see us while we were sleeping. That's a, that's exactly what it was. But I think I think that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Oh my God. You guys are like gearing up for battle. And I then would, yeah. she's like, she's like, I just wanted my own space. I just wanted my own room. And and, <laughs> and literally naps, everything. Everything works out smoothly now. Yeah. She's like a best sleeper in the whole house. Sleep from like eight to eight every night. That is bananas. And it's just because I that one weekend I just made that commitment. Okay, what did, what did your wife say when she got back? Well, I, I kinda I didn't make up a story, but I was like <laughs> The first night I fell asleep and I, I forgot to go Isn't it funny how you're like, okay, hang on, hang on. Because I didn't want to make, I didn't want to make too big of a scene because I wanted her to be excited about it. Right, but you're, but you're scheming. <laughs> I She's was scheming in Disneyland a little bit. and you're at the, you're at the breakfast table over your coffee, like your baby's probably still asleep and you're like, yeah. how am I gonna? How like, am I gonna? How am I gonna, <laughs> how am I gonna word this? Because I'm at the same time, I'm like I want to share every minute of this with her because right. I figured it out and but I saw the presentation. The so yeah, I I I think I said that the first <laughs> night I accidentally figured out what it was, and because I didn't sleep in that room, I slept on the couch. I fell asleep watching a movie. And, and did that work? Is that what happened? And up until like recently, I told her, oh I was like, God. I don't. She Wait. didn't. She <laughs> said, she didn't know I was planning it for this weekend. Um, <laughs> I. I think I told her that I was like, you know what? I'm just going to let her sleep yeah. in her crib. Yeah. And so I actually moved the crib over earlier. Yeah. She didn't know that I was you know, pre-playing this for like two weeks. That's amazing. I was like, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do it. It's just me. Might as yeah. well just do it while I'm home. Um, and she's already in a moment of transition too. Totally. Because like, oh, mom's not there. Like, oh, it's a little bit different. Oh, I guess this is what we do now. Yeah. And that actually probably worked out really well. Yeah. And, and it was easier for mom thankful. too. She was mom mad didn't at me. Have to I have didn't the... explain it to her. Um. Well, she wasn't mad, but she was like, oh, yeah, well, I can't believe you did this and I didn't. You know, I couldn't figure this out and da 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 da. And- Dude, kids, I mean, kids are bananas. But here's the thing when you have a baby who's under 12 months old and, and you're the mom, I know that, like, obviously you're on the journey, right? Yeah. But our biology changes. Sure. And our brains are fucking psycho. Our brains are mm. insane. Like, I, I was. Looking back to that, those first 12 months and specifically the first six with Graham 
And I was like, not me. Like, like something happens to your brain chemistry where you're just like so um like taken over by like motherhood for one you're immersed in motherhood but also like the hormonal changes like you can't logic like you can't reason when it comes to your baby when it comes to your baby and so like like one thing that graham does is he (laughs) i wonder if your baby does this too has has have your girls started fighting over toys yes absolutely oh yeah so graham instigates it my younger one instigates it and he's one and i'm like you're diabolical yeah that and mine doesn't do that oh she waits not just wait, but just wait. But, yeah. He because she's my my kid is a bit older than yours now, and this is kind of yeah. newer. Where he'll like snatch a toy and then he'll go ah! uh, and like crawl adult. away with it and like wait for Grady to come chase him. But it's almost like funny to him. Okay. And he'll do the same thing to Grady. Where like like if Grady says, "Graham, don't do that," if Graham ha- is touching him, Grady will be like, "Don't touch me," and then Graham will go like, "Yeah." <laughs> and just like keep touching him, and so so this will happen where Graham like will ta- have something, and he's used to his older bit his older brother taking it from him. Yeah, and I I literally cannot take something from him, and it's not because I'm not strong enough. It's just that he's stronger mm. because he's my baby, yeah. and so like he'll have something, and I'll be like Graham, give it to me, give it to me, and it's not that I'm being like. Like a um like a rollover parent, but like I literally can't rip it out of his hands or something or like do that because then he starts crying and then I feel like a terrible mother. And Bryce will see me like struggling and he'll come up behind him and just pluck whatever is out of his hands and Graham will be like, Oh, okay. And like it's no big deal. <laughs> but I cannot do it. Like if it's something that he either doesn't need or if he's just like not like getting his diaper changed because yeah. he wants to like play or something. Yeah. I just it's just different. It's I yeah, I'm just now entering that world of of sharing toys and um my youngest i don't maybe she is more smarter than i think oh, she, oh she's definitely the she's smart probably one. a little smarter but she'll um she'll just always want what the other has yeah and the, the issue is is that um we just had a birthday for the one-year-old so there's all these new toys <gasps> and uh-huh. my older wants to play with them yeah but then i ultimately have to say well that's technically her toy right and now it's like now you're learning like those boundaries yeah, and those so that, are different i think that that's where the conversation started to come a little bit I'm like mm, well sorry <laughs> you have a boatload of other toys sitting on the shelf that it's not good enough yours. she wants those uh, she wants those she, yeah this morning she broke the tambourine that was my youngest and she's like i'm sorry i broke i'm broke eden's toy and i'm like like well uh, she's like maybe we can get a new one i'm like I don't think so. Maybe. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you broke it. Sorry. I was just trying to teach that ramification. Right, of right, like, right. You just got to take care of other people's stuff. and you know. Yeah, it's hard. Parenting, man. All right. So uh, <laughs> that was episode, I think it's episode three. Um, hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, yeah. So this was Stephanie Luga. Where can they find you and get connected with you if they want to follow you or what you're doing? Um, so kind of hard to find me sometimes. Stephanie Lugo, um, just search it. You'll find me on YouTube there. You'll find me on my website at stephanielugo.com. If you want to hang out on Instagram, it's Bryce and Stephanie. So put the little, like, spell it out in your show notes because it's my husband and I. Sure. Since we're a husband There'll be a link in there, too. Another thing about long form, you can put links now. Well, not now, but they they took it away for shorts. You can't do it shorts. It's not links anymore. Oh, that's silly. Yeah, I don't know why. Oh. YouTube's just trying to... You know. Well, they're being curious. See. They're being curious. They're testing. <laughs> they're I know testing. people get mad They have at a them. scientist mindset. <laughs> they probably do. Their algorithm... Whoever's making their algorithm is smarter than all of us. Uh-huh. So. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, I will... Uh, I'll see you all later. Bye. Bye.